13, woman takes hangry to a whole new level. Impatience gave way to violence at a Memphis Burger King drive-thru in March 2021, when a woman became so angry about the wait time for her order that she opened fire on the staff. According to employees, the woman exited the passenger side of a vehicle and approached the window, where she got into a verbal altercation with two workers. And during the argument, she allegedly threatened to shoot the staff members. The woman then returned to the vehicle, and assuming that she was going to grab a gun, employees ran to the back of the restaurant. Surveillance footage showed the disgruntled customer firing through the window multiple times with a black handgun, but thankfully nobody was hit by the bullets. The suspect fled the scene. Two days later, authorities charged 32-year-old Keona Jackson with two counts of attempted first-degree murder and using a firearm in the commission of a felony. Unfortunately, though, the outcome of the case is unclear. What would put you in a worse mood? Waiting forever for your fast food after an extremely long day when you're exhausted but not necessarily starving? Or when you're wide awake and energetic but have barely eaten in the last 24 hours? 12. Murdered Before Morning Coffee 35-year-old schoolteacher Rachel King likely had no idea she was being followed when she left for work on the morning of April 11, 2023. Before her shift, she pulled into a Dunkin' Donuts drive through in the Philadelphia suburb of Cheltenham. And it was there where a man approached her and shot her multiple times through her car window. King died from her injuries and the shooter fled the scene. Investigators soon discovered that the teacher had been followed out of her apartment complex by a silver mercury sable. And surveillance footage showed the same car lurking around the complex in the days leading up to King's murder. According to authorities, some of the video was clear enough to obtain a license plate number from the suspect's vehicle. They then traced the car to 33-year-old Zaki Stephen Alakim, who's accused of murdering King for the mother of his cousin's children, 34-year-old Julie Jean. And so, he was taken into custody after crashing the Mercury during a brief police chase. In a statement, prosecutors said that Julie Jean had a brief affair with King's long-term partner, William Hayes. But after King found out about the affair, Hayes ended things with Jean and King agreed to reconcile. Angered by the rejection from Hayes, Jean allegedly embarked on a prolonged harassment and stalking campaign against both him and King. And at one point, King even prompted Hayes to file for a protective order against Jean. According to investigators, evidence shows that Jean and Alakim met several times starting roughly two months before King's murder. Alakim also reportedly saved a screenshot of King's residence in his phone shortly after he began communicating with Jean, as well as photos of the victim. The suspects are also accused of buying the Mercury Sable together about two weeks before the murder. Jean and Alakim both face multiple charges including first-degree murder, third-degree murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. And additionally, Alakim has also been charged in connection with a separate murder that happened four days before King was killed. 11. Wait for change leads to chokehold While working overnight as a shift manager at a Minneapolis McDonald's in 2015, 22-year-old Bernard Robinson III couldn't make change for his own drawer for a customer who paid for a $3 order with a $100 bill. He went to a cashier for the change, but apparently the customer got sick of waiting. So when Robinson returned to the window with the money, the disgruntled patron started angrily talking smack. Robinson later told the Star Tribune that the man then got out of his vehicle, looked him directly in the eyes, and spat in his face. While the two men argued, an employee tried to close the drive through window, but the customer pushed it back open. Disturbing footage of the encounter showed the man grabbing Robinson by his tie and choking him as he pulled the young man forward through the window. The customer finally calmed down after the police arrived. At the time, Robinson's injuries didn't feel severe, so he turned down medical treatment and finished down his shift. But he seemed to regret it later on when he spoke with reporters, noting how he was icing his bruises and that he should have gone to the hospital. Robinson also said that he fought for his life during the struggle. Footage of the incident first appeared online after being posted by the customer who was waiting behind the irate man in the drive through In the caption, the person explained that he was also getting impatient about the wait. 
but when he saw the assault taking place, he took his phone out and began recording the altercation. The suspect was arrested on a misdemeanor assault charge. Unfortunately, though, it's unclear what happened after that. A lot of attacks on fast food workers seem to stem from customers getting frustrated with long waits. But any rational person would agree that attacking someone is an extreme reaction to an arguably trivial problem. 10. Billionaire Mobster Murdered at Mickey D's Mafia boss Sylvester Salidazzatola had already survived multiple assassination attempts when he was fatally shot at a McDonald's drive-thru in the Bronx in 2018. The 71-year-old real estate magnate was picking up his daily coffee when he was hit with a hailstorm of bullets. This event brought a year-long campaign of stalking, harassment, and physical assaults to a tragic end. Investigators quickly zeroed in on the mobster's son, 41-year-old Anthony Zatola, who helped manage his father's properties. He plotted the murder right under the elder Zatola's nose in a bid to acquire his father's 90 properties, which were collectively valued at around $45 million. The first act of violence against Sylvester came in November 2017, when a masked man threatened him at gunpoint. Then, less than a month later, three intruders broke into his home and stabbed him multiple times. He survived, despite being slashed across the throat, and the attempts on his life continued until he was dead. Apparently, in addition to having no idea that his own son was trying to have him killed, Sylvester was unaware that a tracking device had been placed on his car. Federal authorities charged Anthony Zatola with his father's murder, which they claimed he carried out with help from Bloods member Bashawn Shelton and another man named Hyman Ross. Shelton helped plan the murder and stalked Sylvester while Ross allegedly acted as the trigger man. Anthony was accused of paying his accomplices $200,000 to kill his dad. He also allegedly hired hitmen to kill his brother Salvatore Zatola who was shot in his front yard and survived bullet wounds to his head, chest, and hand. After receiving word over text that the job had been completed, Anthony allegedly joked with his co-conspirators, responding, can we party today or tomorrow? He also spoke in code about the payment for the hit, stating that it had the cases of water in a day or so. And based on all the other evidence in the case, it was obvious to detectives that the cases of water referred to the $200,000 payment. Anthony and Hyman Ross were both found guilty in the murder for hire plot and received mandatory life sentences. But Sean Shelton pleaded guilty to murder for hire and murder for hire conspiracy, and as a result, he was sentenced to 37 years in prison. 9. Robbery Suspect Falls Through Ceiling Shortly after 2 a.m. one July morning in 2023, police in Huron, Ohio were alerted to an alarm going off at a vacation land Federal Credit Union branch. When officers arrived and began searching the property, they initially didn't see anything suspicious. But alarms don't go off for no reason, so they continued to investigate. Their first clue about the incident in question came when they heard strange noises coming from above the bank's drive through Body cam footage captured what sounded like someone clunking around in high heels or heavy shoes. And the noise came from inside the part of the building that sits over the drive through lanes. On the pavement below, a recycle bin was placed strategically under a hatch in the ceiling. The officers stood by and waited for the right moment to take action as a backpack dropped into the recycle bin. Then, Moments later, two feet dangled out of the opening in the ceiling, and a grown man plunged into the receptacle. One of the officers could be heard commanding the suspect to get on the ground. Realizing there was no way out of the situation, the alleged burglar wisely chose not to be combative. But he also didn't immediately get on the ground, so the officers had to pull him out of the bin. In the end, 27-year-old Tristan Heidel was charged with breaking and entering, possession of criminal tools, and safe cracking. Speaking with local station WJW Fox 8, Huron Police Chief Terry Graham revealed that the suspect's attempts to access money inside the bank failed, and that he was empty-handed when police apprehended him. Graham also said that it was the first time in his 35-year career that he ever saw a suspect fall into a garbage can. 8. A Side Order of Scalding Oil 
ongoing tensions between a Wendy's manager and a disgruntled drive through customer in Huntington, Tennessee, allegedly reached a boiling point, literally, in October 2021. On the day in question, 21-year-old Damaris Pritchett was accused of dousing an unsatisfied patron with scalding hot oil from a deep fryer. According to police, Pritchett got into a verbal altercation with Xavion Johnson, who complained that his food was cold when he received it. An arrest report stated that Pritchett was in the process of giving Johnson a cash refund when he went into the restaurant's kitchen to obtain oil from a deep fryer. When he returned to the drive through window, he allegedly splashed some of the hot oil on Johnson, leaving the customer with obvious extensive blistering. Johnson received medical treatment for his burn injuries, and Pritchett was arrested on suspicion of felony aggravated assault. During questioning, Pritchett allegedly told police that Johnson had been harassing him in recent weeks over a matter relating to dogs. The nature of the canine-related conflict wasn't detailed in the complaint, but law enforcement clearly didn't see it as a reason to attack someone with hot oil. After smiling for his mugshot and being booked into the county jail, Pritchett posted a $5,000 bond and was released while awaiting the next steps in his case. A similar incident made headlines just six months later when an Arby's employee was accused of pouring hot grease on a complaining customer in Hueytown, Alabama. According to police, 50-year-old Shia Denise Peoples got into an altercation with a customer while working the drive through window in April of 2022. In the words of Hueytown Police Chief Mike Yarbrough, Peoples just snapped as the argument escalated. The victim, Jamiria Hairston, was left with second-degree burns over a large portion of her body. Unfortunately, her children were with her at the time of the alleged attack, but thankfully they managed to avoid the path of the searing grease. Peoples was probably fired from her job and was charged with first-degree assault. Customers are sometimes afraid to complain about their food at a drive through even when they have a good reason for it, because they're worried that the employees might spit in their food. 7. Pit Stop During a Police Pursuit A wild police chase in Worcester, Massachusetts during the summer of 2021 came to an abrupt end when a suspected car thief pulled into a McDonald's drive through to grab a bite to eat. The incident in question began when 38-year-old Joanna Gardell allegedly stole a work truck that was transporting equipment to a work site shortly before 9 a.m. Police were called, and it appeared as though the incident was under control when the suspect initially pulled over for a patrol car. But she took off during the traffic stop and began driving recklessly. According to local station WHDH, Gardell began weaving in and out of the traffic and crossed over into the wrong lane before striking a van, ripping off its bumper in the process. As two officers approached the stolen truck in an attempt to take the suspect into custody, she allegedly threw the vehicle into reverse and slammed on the gas. The truck backed up into a police cruiser at a high speed, knocking down an officer and dragging him between 15 and 25 feet. Thankfully, though, the officer's injuries weren't life-threatening. A little while later, officers saw the truck pull into a McDonald's drive through and that's when they made their second attempt to approach the suspect, who reportedly crashed into another police cruiser, this time on purpose. But she likely didn't mean to run the stolen vehicle off the road and get stuck, which is what happened next. Police were finally able to apprehend Gardell, now that the truck wasn't going anywhere. She was evaluated at a hospital before being booked on a dozen charges, including failure to stop for police, operating to endanger, leaving the scene of an accident with personal injury and disturbing the peace. She was also charged for operating on a suspended license, received two counts of assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon, and one count of use of motor vehicle without authority. She was held without bail pending the outcome of her case. 6. Methadone Mom Makes Multiple drive through Visits Workers at a McDonald's restaurant in Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania, were perplexed when the same woman repeatedly went through the drive through one night in 2020, seemingly unaware of her previous visits. Sensing that she was under the influence of a mind-altering substance and concerned for the safety of the two children who were in the back seat of the woman's vehicle, employees called the police to report the suspicious behavior. According to a police report, 29-year-old Skylar Perrin's vehicle was unoccupied when officers first arrived at the McDonald's. 
They followed her out of the parking lot after she exited the restaurant and pulled her over for having a busted brake light and failing to use a turn signal. Perrin allegedly admitted to taking methadone. She then told the police that it was prescribed to treat her opioid addiction, which is a common use for the medication. Perrin also reportedly said that she returned to the restaurant because one of her children decided they wanted a hamburger after they left the previous time. Upon noticing signs of intoxication, officers conducted a field sobriety test. Apparently, Perrin did poorly on it and was taken into custody on three counts of DUI and one felony count of endangering the welfare of a child. But it's not exactly clear what punishment she received. 5. Drive through murders claim family members decades apart. 26 year old Devontae Jackox was working at an MS fast food drive through in Mansfield, Ohio, in early 2023, when a masked suspect approached the business and opened fire on the people inside. Jackox was killed in the late night shooting, while two others were injured by the gunfire. The restaurant's owner, 35 year old Fares Fares, was shell shocked by the deadly incident. Speaking with News 5 Cleveland, the restauranteur said that the suspect didn't make eye contact with anyone before he began pulling the trigger. Surveillance footage showed customers fleeing from the restaurant moments after the shots rang out, while the suspect fled on foot and disappeared around a corner. Sadly, no arrests have been made in the case, but authorities are hoping that someone with information will come forward and help bring the shooter to justice. Devonte Jacox's untimely death came almost exactly 24 years after his grandfather was shot to death at a drive through window on the city's north end. 49-year-old Clarence Jacox Jr. was working at a Papa Johnny's drive through in March of 1999 when three armed men robbed the restaurant. The suspects were all charged in connection with the case and are currently serving life sentences. 4. Confrontation spirals out of control a confrontation between two men that started at a McDonald's drive through in Albuquerque, New Mexico, ended in deadly gunfire in April 2023. Yvette Benavides told police that she was riding as a passenger with 39-year-old Victor Torres when a vehicle pulled up beside them at the drive through Benavides said that she was sleeping at the time and that she awoke to a shouting match between Torres and the man behind the wheel of the other car, 24-year-old DeAndre Vigil. She accused Vigil of threatening Torres and said that it looked like he was reaching for a gun in his car. Fearing that the situation was about to turn deadly, Benavidez told Torres to drive away. Vigil allegedly followed the pair, and at some point, Torres stopped and approached Vigil's vehicle on foot. According to Benavidez, Torres asked Vigil why he was following him and told him to stop, at which point Vigil responded, Come over here, big boy, I got something for you. As Torres once again asked the suspect why he was following them, several gunshots rang out. Torres was fatally injured, and the suspect fled the scene in his vehicle. Police identified Vigil as the alleged killer based on surveillance footage and eyewitness accounts. At the time, he was wanted on a robbery warrant and was suspected of being involved in a case in which a victim was shot multiple times. Vigil faces one count each of open murder and shooting at or from a motor vehicle, and is also charged with multiple crimes stemming from unrelated incidents, including aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and armed robbery. He remains behind bars without bail while awaiting trial. Authorities haven't yet said whether Vigil and Torres had any prior connections leading up to the deadly confrontation. But based on the version of events that's been put forth so far, it seems as though the two men didn't know each other at all. 3. Attempted Abduction In a terrifying close call that was captured on camera in early 2023, a barista was nearly kidnapped through a drive through window at a coffee shop in Auburn, Washington. Footage of the encounter showed a pickup truck pulling up to the window shortly before 5 a.m. The interaction between the customer and the woman serving him initially seemed to be going normally as the man in the truck paid for his order with cash. While being handed his change, however, he grabbed the employee's wrist and tried to pull her through the window using what police later described as a looped zip-tie device. Thankfully, though, the woman was able to fight off her attacker, who sped away from the scene once it became clear that he'd overestimated the victim's ability to defend herself. 
The situation could have been much worse, especially since the barista was working alone at the time. Less than 24 hours after releasing harrowing surveillance footage of the attempted abduction to the public, authorities apprehended a suspect. They haven't revealed the person's name, but said that they identified him based on multiple tips from people who recognized him. It's unclear whether the victim and the suspect knew each other, and for now, the case appears to be ongoing. 2. Fleeing Fugitive Escapes Pursuit A Canadian police officer is lucky to be alive after being shot in the head outside a McDonald's restaurant in Port Hope, Ontario. The nearly fatal incident happened in late July of 2023 during a manhunt for a fugitive in his 20s named Jordan Denny. According to the Ontario Provincial Police, Denny was wanted on multiple warrants when Port Hope officers responded to reports of a suspected stolen vehicle being spotted in the McDonald's drive through Denny was allegedly behind the wheel when the cops tried to engage him, but he wasn't in the mood to be cooperative. A gun was discharged during the interaction, and a female officer was struck by the bullet. Initial reports stated that the officer was hit by a bullet from her own service weapon that ricocheted after she fired at the vehicle. But it's unclear whether this was the case or if the bullet came from the suspect's weapon. The case was then referred to Ontario's Special Investigations Unit to determine what actually happened. Meanwhile, the injured officer was reported to be in stable condition at the hospital. The suspect fled the scene amid the chaos and remains at large. Several police agencies have issued warnings for civilians to be on the lookout for an older model GMC Canyon pickup truck that they believe the suspect is driving. Authorities are unsure whether Denny is armed, but have cautioned the public not to approach the vehicle under any circumstances. And now for number one. But if you want to hear even more stories, stay tuned for some extra content that you might have missed. 1. Man Pulls Trigger in Unprovoked Attack Most drive through shootings occur as the result of some sort of conflict, usually between a disgruntled customer and an employee. But 24-year-old Justin Michael Mullis apparently didn't need a reason to approach a McDonald's restaurant in Elko, Nevada and open fire on a young staff member who was working the drive through window. Kylie Lennis died in the horrific act of violence, which occurred in late 2020, and Mullis fled the scene. Thankfully, though, he was driven to the police station the next day and was taken into custody on multiple charges, including one count of open murder. According to police, there was no known previous connection between Mullis and Lennon's, and the attack appeared to be unprovoked. Footage from shortly after the shooting showed Mullis entering a Best Western hotel and leaving in a different outfit. He later admitted that he threw the clothing that he wore during the crime into a dumpster behind the hotel. The case finally went to trial in 2022, after the court determined that Mullis was competent to stand trial. His mental health remained at the center of the defense's argument, along with the dismal details of the defendant's painful childhood. Additionally, public defender Matthew Pennell urged jurors to consider Mullis's so-called genetic proclivity toward substance abuse and mental health issues, as well as his alleged inability to control his emotions. Prosecutors acknowledged that Mullis had a rough upbringing but reminded the jury that the trial was about his deliberate and calculated decision to murder an innocent victim in cold blood. The jury was ultimately unswayed by Pennell's pleas to consider the defendant's past and mental health as mitigating factors, and Mullis was found guilty of first-degree murder and concealing or destroying evidence. And as a result, he was sentenced to life without parole. Number 17. Disagreement between strangers turns deadly In late March of 2022, an altercation broke out between a woman and two others outside a 7-Eleven store in Tucson, Arizona. And at some point, the woman got into her car and mowed the pair down. 79-year-old Anthony Ames died, and the woman he was with, Joy Roman, sustained serious injuries. But instead of facing the consequences of her actions, the suspect fled the scene on foot. Roman later told local station KVOA that the last thing she remembered before blacking out was a tire coming at her face. She suffered a broken pelvis as a result, as well as several broken ribs and facial bones. Police arrested the suspect, 20-year-old Elaine Vernette Boone, about two weeks after the deadly hit and run. 
She was booked on several charges, including aggravated assault with a dangerous instrument and second-degree homicide. Roman was particularly disgusted by Boone's ear-to-ear -ear grin and her mugshot. During her interview with KVOA, the victim said that she hoped that the young woman got what she deserved for her actions. And according to state records, Boone was convicted of negligent homicide and is now serving a two-and-a-half-year prison sentence. Number 16. Strip Club Shooting At around 11 p.m. on December 30, 2021, a woman who'd just left the Centerfolds nightclub in Chico, California, re-entered the building and asked employees to call the police. And when they asked her to explain, she said her friend had been shot. Butte County deputies arrived to find 21-year-old Alicia Flores suffering from multiple gunshot wounds, including one to the head. Employees had tried to perform CPR on her while waiting for help to arrive, but they were unable to save her. Just an hour earlier, Flores had been seen entering the club with 29-year-old Fernando Palinares and his girlfriend. The girlfriend was still on the scene, but Palinares was nowhere in sight. But inside his SUV, police found multiple fired and unfired 9mm rounds. Deputies later found Palomares walking along a roadside. He claimed that he'd been home that night and was just out for a walk, but his story wasn't believed. Authorities charged Palomares with murder and two weapon-related counts. And while searching a field near the strip club, they recovered a gun that they say he used to kill Flores. At the time of the shooting, Palomares was out on parole for the stabbing of a rival gang member back in 2012. He'd been released from prison just seven months earlier in May 2021. And according to the most recent available updates on the case, Palomares was slated to go to trial in June of 2023. Number 15. Hotel Face-Off What began as a verbal confrontation quickly escalated into a terrifying act of violence outside an Arkansas hotel in early June of 2023. Shortly after midnight, Fayetteville police responded to multiple reports of gunfire at a Quality Inn. Witnesses told officers the two men were arguing in the parking lot when the fight became physical. One of the men, later identified as 25-year-old Landy and Marky e. Wright, allegedly knocked the other participant unconscious and continued to hit him after he fell to the ground. Bystanders intervened, at which point the attacker went to his room. But moments later, he emerged with a rifle and shot at one of the Good Samaritans from an outdoor stairwell. The bullet struck several vehicles and a trash can, but no gunfire-related injuries were reported. Responding officers went to Wright's room, where they discovered that he'd put the rifle in a suitcase and changed his clothes. He was then taken into custody without incident and was cooperative during questioning. Wright is currently behind bars on $750,000 bail at the Washington County Jail on suspicion of attempted murder, committing a terroristic act, and four counts of first-degree criminal mischief. Number 14. Attack at Dawn 18-year-old Naomi Irian disappeared from a Walmart in Fernley, Nevada during the early morning hours on March 12, 2022. She was waiting for a shuttle to her job at around 5 a.m. when suddenly she vanished. Her abandoned car was found three days later in an industrial area nearby. Surveillance video reportedly showed a hooded man, later identified as 41-year-old Troy Driver, circling Naomi's vehicle before forcing his way in through the driver's side and speeding off with Naomi in the passenger seat. Acting on a tip several weeks later, police discovered Naomi's remains in a shallow grave at a remote mining site in neighboring Churchill County. Sadly, she died from multiple gunshot wounds to the head and chest. Driver was charged with a slew of crimes, including first-degree murder, kidnapping, assault, burglary of a motor vehicle, robbery with the use of a deadly weapon, and destroying evidence. And according to prosecutors, he tried to conceal his alleged crimes by disposing of his truck tires and destroying Naomi's phone. Driver ended up pleading not guilty to the crimes he was accused of, and as of now, the case is ongoing. Number 13. Deadly Donuts a teenager named Jolissa Hernandez was drunk at 5 a.m. one day in 2022 when she decided to do donuts in the parking lot of a grocery store in Willis, Texas. She had two friends in the car with her when she performed the burnouts with her Toyota Corolla. But unfortunately for everyone involved, the light-hearted fun took a deadly turn when the vehicle struck a wire supporting a utility pole and flipped onto its side. Garrett Spry was thrown from the car and died, 
while the other passenger survived with injuries. Hernandez, however, reportedly emerged from the ordeal without so much as a scratch. While investigating the scene, police reportedly found open containers of alcohol inside the car. They then obtained a warrant to perform a blood draw on Hernandez, who had a blood alcohol content of 0 0.107. Authorities tracked the purchase of the booze to a nearby gas station and arrested the clerk for selling alcohol to someone under the age of 21. Meanwhile, Hernandez was booked into the Montgomery County Jail on suspicion of intoxication manslaughter, which can carry a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. She was convicted of the charge and was sentenced to 120 days in jail, followed by 10 years of probation, and she's also required to use an interlocking device on her car to prevent her from driving drunk. In this particular case, prosecutors consulted the victim's family in their efforts to work out a plea agreement that was both appropriate for the crime and which had the approval of Garrett Spry's loved ones. But this isn't always the case, and a victim's family often feels let down by the justice system. And of course, the court of public opinion wastes no time making its consensus crystal clear. Number 12. Opportunist Targets Unsuspecting Teen 18-year-old Kelsey Smith had just graduated from high school and was looking forward to starting college in the fall when she and her boyfriend made plans to celebrate their six-month anniversary over dinner in 2007. Shortly before their date on the evening of June 2nd, she stopped at a Target store in Overland Park, Kansas to buy her boyfriend an anniversary gift. She called her mother while she was in the store, but she never returned home or showed up for the dinner date. Knowing that something was seriously wrong, her family reported her missing and an investigation was immediately launched. About four hours later, Kelsey's car was found abandoned in the parking lot of a mall, which is located just across the street from the Target store. Her belongings were inside the vehicle, leading police to suspect that she'd been kidnapped. Surveillance footage showed a man following Kelsey around the Target store, then forcing her into her car at 7.10 p.m. Two hours later at 9.17 p.m., the male subject parked the car outside of a Macy's store and fled the seen on foot. Authorities released a video clip to the public in hopes that someone would be able to identify the suspect. Four days later, after struggling to get Kelsey's cell phone data from her provider and finally convincing the company to hand it over, the information led investigators to Grandview, Missouri, roughly 20 miles from where she was abducted. Her body was found in a wooded area next to Longview Lake, and it was later determined that someone had strangled the young woman to death with her own belt. The same day, someone called law enforcement and said that the man in the surveillance footage resembled her neighbor, Edwin Roy Hall, who goes by the nickname Jack. And when authorities showed up at his house, he was getting ready to leave town with his wife and son, supposedly for a vacation. During questioning, he admitted to being a target, but denied approaching Kelsey. But police knew that was a lie when his fingerprint matched a print that was left inside the victim's car. Hall was charged with multiple crimes as a result, including aggravated kidnapping and premeditated first-degree murder. He took a plea agreement in order to avoid the death penalty and pleaded guilty to all charges in exchange for a sentence of life without parole, plus an additional 47 years. Following the tragedy, Kelsey's family pioneered an ongoing movement to create new laws that would require phone companies to provide timely location information in the event of an emergency. Number 11. A Deadly Obsession 29-year-old Patrice Wilson had just finished working the night shift at a Detroit hospital in May 2023 and was about to drive home when a man in a blonde wig abducted her at gunpoint. The culprit then forced Patrice into her own car and sped off. Police identified the suspect as the young woman's ex-boyfriend, 36-year-old Jamia Miller. Shortly after the kidnapping, Patrice's mother told Click on Detroit that her daughter was trying to get away from Miller because he was toxic. Relatives claimed that Miller was the subject of a viral TikTok video from 2021 that showed a man trying to break into Patrice's home. In the footage, which was captured by a doorbell camera, a man wearing gloves and a mask could be seen approaching a home and tugging at the door handle while trying to cover the camera lens. A woman behind the camera could be heard saying, Jamia, are you breaking into my house? Are you serious? 
The man kept tugging at the door and said, why would I break into your house? At which point the woman questioned why he was at her front door wearing gloves. After learning of Patrice's abduction, authorities issued an alert to the public describing Miller as armed and dangerous. He was still at large the next day when Patrice's body was found in the trunk of an SUV outside her apartment complex in Novi, and unfortunately, she'd been fatally shot. Miller was taken into custody the following day. He was charged with a laundry list of crimes, including first-degree murder, felony murder, carjacking, armed robbery, felon in possession of a firearm, and five other gun-related felony counts. Miller has yet to be sentenced, though, because the case is ongoing. Number 10. Serial Killers Parking Lot Slayings a 23-year-old dance instructor and single mom named Diane Cusick left her Long Island, New York home one evening in February 1968 to shop for a new pair of shoes. But she never returned, prompting her concerned parents to go looking for her. They found her strangled to death in the back seat of her car outside of a shopping mall in Valley Stream. Her mouth was covered with duct tape and her hands were bound. Sadly, though, the investigation failed to turn up any useful leads and the case went cold. In 2021, the Nassau County Medical Examiner had evidence from the crime retested for DNA, and it generated a profile which matched to a convicted serial killer named Richard Cottingham. Known as the Torso Killer or the Times Square Killer, Cottingham was already serving time for killing and dismembering several victims in New York and New Jersey. Before he landed behind bars, he was a married father of three who lived in Lodi, New Jersey, and worked as a computer operator in Manhattan. Cottingham rented an apartment near his workplace and told his wife that he worked overnight, but in reality he was on the prowl for female victims to assault and kill. He targeted mostly prostitutes, but was an opportunist who often acted on impulse, which meant that no woman was truly safe. He was finally caught in 1980 after workers at a hotel in New Jersey overheard a woman screaming from inside a room. Investigators soon connected him with the murders of four other missing women, and Cottingham was convicted in all five cases despite his claims of innocence. He received multiple life sentences, ensuring that he'd never step foot outside a prison again. One of these first five cases was the 1976 murder of a 26-year-old X-ray technician named Mary Ann Carr, who was found beaten and strangled in a motel parking lot. Detectives suspected that Cottingham had other victims, but it took years for them to link him to more murders. In the early 2000s, a keen-eyed detective named Robert Ancelotti zeroed in on Cottingham as the prime suspect in several unsolved cases. The circumstances were much different than the serial killer's known crimes because the victims weren't prostitutes and they weren't dismembered. But over a several-year period, Ancelotti built a rapport with Cottingham, giving him special treatment in hopes that he'd open up about some of his other crimes. He eventually admitted to killing several women, whose families agreed to forego having the cases prosecuted since Cottingham was in prison for life anyway. Ancelotti made this request because Cottingham hated media attention and he knew the convicted killer might stop talking to him if his name was plastered all over the news. The detective also knew that there were likely more victims, so he wanted to keep Cottingham appeased for the time being. One of the cases Cottingham admitted to being responsible for was the 1967 murder of Nancy Schiava Vogel, a 29-year-old mother of two who was found strangled in her car in Ridgefield Park, New Jersey. In 2020, Ancelotti got Cottingham to confess to a particularly gruesome double murder that had sat at the top of his priority list to solve for years. At the time, he was about to retire, and he also thought the public deserved to know about the highly publicized cases. Cottingham was prosecuted and convicted of both murders, and the following year, his DNA was identified in Diane Cusick's case. After linking him to Cusick's murder, detectives took yet another look at unsolved homicides in New York and New Jersey, connecting him to four more cases from 1972 and 1973. As part of a plea deal, 76-year-old Cottingham admitted to murdering Diane Cusick in exchange for getting the other four cases dropped. On top of the sentences he was already serving, he received a sentence of 25 years to life. 
Nobody knows exactly how many women Cottingham has killed. He's claimed that he's murdered as many as a hundred victims, and it's believed that he started killing as a teen. He's pushing 80 years old now, and is reportedly in ailing health, so he'll probably take at least some secrets to the grave. But it also wouldn't be surprising if he made some deathbed confessions. Number 9. Hit and Run Suspect Held Responsible on September 9, 2022, police in Everett, Washington received a call about an SUV blocking the entrance to a parking lot. Officers arrived to find a woman passed out behind the wheel of a Ford Escape with drug paraphernalia in her hand and suspected fentanyl in her possession. While examining the vehicle, they noticed damage consistent with that of an SUV involved in a hit and run weeks earlier. There was also blood on the front passenger side corner of the car. The first three numbers and letters on the license plate matched with a witness's memory of the hit and run suspect's license plate. And when shown a lineup of photos, the witness identified with 90% certainty the vehicle's owner, 32 year old Amber Conaway, as the person he saw fleeing the scene of the hit and run. 80-year-old Patty O'Man had been fatally struck by an SUV while walking home from buying some lottery tickets. According to the witness who helped identify Conaway, the driver got out of their vehicle and briefly glanced over at Oman before fleeing the scene. He said the suspect had an annoyed expression on their face and left without rendering help while he dialed 911. And unfortunately, Oman died in the hospital four days later. Police had also received several tips pointing toward Conaway as the the owner of the vehicle in question, which they posted photos of online along with an appeal to the public for information. In the end, Conaway was charged with one count of hit and run fatality. However, the current status of the case is unclear. Number 8. Romantic Date Interrupted by Murder in early 2023, 29-year-old Eric Aguirre made plans to meet with a woman from a dating app at a restaurant in Houston, Texas. Upon arriving, he was told by a man claiming to be a parking attendant that he had to pay $20 to park. The attendant told Aguirre that as long as he returned to the parking lot with his receipt, he'd get his money back. So Aguirre withdrew $40 from a nearby ATM for both his and his date's vehicles and they went inside to eat. They were about to sit down when an employee the employee approached Aguirre and told him that the man claiming to be a parking attendant was a scammer. Aguirre told his date he'd be right back and left the restaurant, and when he returned a few minutes later he said that he'd intimidated the scammer and that everything was fine. However, he seemed uneasy and suddenly he decided that he wanted to eat elsewhere. The woman was shocked the next day when she found out that police were circulating her and Aguirre's photos online in an attempt to identify and question them in connection with a fatal shooting. Elliot Nix, the phony parking attendant, had been shot from behind while Aguirre was outside the restaurant the previous evening. Aguirre's date wanted to make it abundantly clear that she wasn't involved and didn't know about the crime until she saw it in the news, so she contacted law enforcement right away and cooperated with them throughout the investigation. Witnesses had reported seeing Aguirre retrieving his gun from his car and chasing after the victim. They said they heard a gunshot, then saw Aguirre calmly walking back to his car, putting his gun inside and re-entering the restaurant. In the end, he was charged with murder and now faces a possible life sentence if convicted. Number 7. The Murder of Melissa Witt as she prepared to attend a college class on the morning of December 1st, 1994, 19-year-old Melissa Witt asked her mother if she could borrow some money. They got into a disagreement, and it was still unresolved when Melissa's mom left their house in Fort Smith, Arkansas for work. Wanting to make things right with her daughter, she left Melissa a note saying to meet her at a bowling alley later that evening so they could talk. After going to class and working her shift at a dental office, Melissa drove to the bowling alley where her mother was in a league. She arrived sometime between 6.30 and 7 p.m., but never made it inside. Her car was found in the parking lot along with blood and signs of a struggle. The teen's keys and one of her earrings were also found nearby. Nearly a month and a half later, in mid-January 1995, a pair of hunters found Melissa's unclothed body in Ozark National Forest, roughly 45 miles from her home. Her decomposed remains were laid near a headstone-like rock. 
The hunters had been in the area less than a day earlier, and the body wasn't there the first time. So they immediately called law enforcement, and it was soon determined that someone had strangled Melissa to death. There's been speculation that Melissa was victimized by a serial killer who was reportedly in the region around the time of her abduction, but police don't think it's likely. No suspects have ever been arrested in connection with the brutal murder, but this isn't due to a lack of trying on law enforcement's part. For nearly 30 years, police have left no stone unturned and have followed every lead that's come in. In the meantime, Melissa's face was featured in an extensive billboard campaign in an effort to keep her at the forefront of the public's conscience. The case has also received widespread media coverage and is the focus of a podcast, a documentary, and even a book. However, police are still waiting for their smoking gun, which they believe could come in the form of a tip from someone who knows something but hasn't yet come forward. With the right piece of information, the case could fall into place. Number 6. Drug-Fueled Misadventure Lands Couple in Custody Around 8 a.m. one day in July of 2022, deputies in Pierce County, Washington responded to a report of a couple passed out in their vehicle in a Starbucks parking lot. They arrived to find the car running with both suspects slumped over in their seats. The vehicle's windshield wipers were going and the hazard lights were on as well. According to the Pierce County Sheriff's Office, the suspects were uncooperative when a deputy roused them and tried to ask questions. As a 32-year-old man in the passenger seat urged her to flee the scene, a 24-year-old woman in the driver's seat threw the car in reverse. She backed into a patrol car and then drove over a curb and around another patrol vehicle before turning onto the road. A deputy got in their car and followed the pair, who ultimately hit another vehicle and caused a four-car collision. The male passenger attempted to flee the scene on foot but was stopped in a parking lot by a good Samaritan. Deputies then arrested a female driver at the scene. At the time of the crash, the suspects had two dogs in the vehicle with them. Both pets were ejected from the car and only one was found. While running the vehicle's VIN number, police discovered that it didn't match the license plate and had been reported stolen weeks earlier. The female suspect and one motorist involved in the crash were hospitalized with injuries. After being released from the hospital, the woman was charged with first-degree assault, felony hit-and-run, vehicular assault, DUI, eluding a police vehicle, possession of a stolen vehicle, animal cruelty, and several drug-related counts. Two bags of methamphetamine were also found in her possession at the hospital. The male suspect received similar charges, but the outcome of the case is unclear. Number 5. Nearly Fatal Mix-Up An innocent mistake took an almost deadly turn in April 2023, when a teenage cheerleader mistook someone else's car as her own in an Elgin, Texas parking lot. Heather Roth and fellow cheerleader Peyton Washington were being dropped off outside a supermarket by some teammates shortly after midnight when Roth approached what she thought was her vehicle. She realized it wasn't her car though when she noticed a man in the passenger seat and later said that she immediately began to apologize as she exited the vehicle. According to Roth, the man threw his hands up, then pulled a gun and and immediately opened fire, striking both her and Washington. The girls then hurried back into their friend's car and fled the scene. They pulled over about two miles down the road after realizing that Washington was seriously injured and determining that the man wasn't following them. And by that point, Washington was throwing up blood. The team dialed 911 and the young woman was rushed to the hospital. She'd been shot twice and suffered multiple damaged organs including her spleen, which was subsequently removed. Washington was hospitalized in the intensive care unit, but was in stable condition in the days following the shooting and was expected to survive. Roth sustained minor injuries and was treated at the scene. The supermarket manager witnessed the shooting and the suspect's license plate was captured on surveillance footage. Police paid a visit to 25-year-old Pedro Tello Rodriguez Jr., who identified himself as an employee of the supermarket. He allegedly claimed he was sleeping at home at the time of the shooting. However, the police knew this was a lie. In the end, Rodriguez was charged with deadly conduct with a firearm and is being held on a $500,000 bond while his case works its way through the court system. Number 4. Mother of Four Meets Foul Play 
25-year-old Yolanda Bindix would have never abandoned her four daughters. So when she failed to return home from her shift at a family dollar store in Jamestown, New York one night in 2004, her family immediately knew something was wrong. Yolanda's brother was watching her kids that night. And before heading home, she called him and told him that she was going to pick up some milk on her way to the house. It was the last time anyone saw or heard from her. The next evening, her car was found abandoned at an Arby's parking lot roughly a half mile from her workplace. About a month after Yolanda went missing, her purse washed up onto the street from an overflowing storm drain following heavy rain, and a subsequent search of a storm sewer turned up her car keys. Two years later, in August 2006, hunters found Yolanda's skeletal remains in a remote wooded area of Chautauqua County. But authorities never announced a suspected cause of death. By then, investigators had focused extensively on three particular persons of interest. One of them was Michael Watson, a Jamestown police officer who Yolanda reportedly had a relationship with. When Yolanda went missing, Watson failed to mention their history to detectives who learned about the relationship from a family member. He claimed that he didn't say anything because it wouldn't have contributed any useful information to the investigation, but his silence set off red flags prompting the FBI and police to investigate. While the investigations failed to turn up any leads in Yolanda's case, authorities charged Watson with stalking and various other crimes in connection with three other women. He lost his job and later sued the department Department, claiming that the charges were part of a ploy to destroy his reputation and career. Police also turned their attention toward Clarence Carl Cart, the father of Yolanda's youngest daughter. He was seen on surveillance footage leaving a gas station almost directly across the street from Yolanda's workplace at almost the exact same time she left the store. Cart was eventually ruled out as a person of interest, but investigators announced that they were revisiting the gas station sighting in 2022. This came after the formation of a cold case unit that shed new light on the case. Authorities also looked at a man named Darian Thomas, who Yolanda went to Niagara Falls with about a week prior to her disappearance. He was the father of her third daughter, and they were reportedly rekindling their relationship, although she'd also recently been seeing Officer Watson. Nearly 20 years later, the case remains unsolved. Nobody knows what happened after Yolanda left work, or how her car ended up in the Arby's parking lot. In her memoir, The Silent Conviction, Yolanda's sister Margaret Queen made it clear that many people have made up their minds about who they think the killer is, even if this person has yet to face justice in a court of law. The Chautauqua County Sheriff's Office remains hopeful that someone will come forward with the silver bullet of information that they need to solve the case. Number 3. The Murder of Thomas Hawk while responding to a call about a man down in a Youngstown, Ohio supermarket parking lot one evening in March 2001, police found 65-year-old Thomas Hawk Jr. on the ground next to a payphone, and apparently he still had the receiver in his hand. Hawk had been shot in the back of the head while making a phone call and was trying to talk but could only make choking noises. Emergency responders rushed Hawk to the hospital, which was just two blocks away, but doctors were unable to save him. Hawk was trying to call his son, Brian, when he was murdered. The call initially went through, but when Brian answered, the other end went dead. Brian later told the Sharon Herald that he recognized the number because his father had called him from it before. He knew it was a payphone, and he initially assumed that Hawk had run out of change. At the scene, responding officers found a spent round and a shell casing near the victim, as well as a bloody footprint. Two witnesses said that they were on their way to class at a local college when they passed the parking lot and saw two men standing over Hawk. According to their accounts, one of the men ran over to a junky 90s model car and sped off. Hawk was one of the 34 people who were murdered in Youngstown in 2001. More than half of those cases remain unsolved, including his. The killer's motive also remains unclear to this day. Police found money in Hawke's pocket, which ruled out the likelihood of a robbery and suggest that they might have had some sort of disagreement that got out of hand. 
After losing his mom and four brothers in a house fire at a young age, Thomas Hawke essentially became a transient. He coped with the loss of his family by traveling all over the United States and picking up work along the way. At some point, he got so used to his lifestyle that he was unable to live any other way. And while he wasn't very involved in his kids' lives, he'd recently reconnected with Brian. Unfortunately, their time to rekindle their father-son bond was cut short in broad daylight, and nobody has come forward to say who's responsible. Number 2. Jane Doe on Fire San Diego police encountered a horrific scene shortly after midnight on January 24, 2000, when they found the body of a woman burning in a church parking lot. Someone had wrapped her in cardboard, secured it with rope, and chopped her hands off before setting her ablaze. And by the time officers arrived, the victim was dead and burned beyond recognition. Law enforcement speculated that the woman was likely killed elsewhere and dumped in the parking lot afterward. At the time, DNA technology was still in its infancy. Detectives relied on a sketch artist to draw a rendering of what the victim might have looked like before she was engulfed in flames. But unfortunately, the portrait failed to yield any helpful information. Nearly two decades went by before investigators sought the help of renowned genetic genealogist named Barbara Ray Venter, who'd helped identify the Golden State Killer. They'd already uploaded Jane Doe's DNA to a public database, but it only turned up matches for distant relatives. It was too big of a family tree for them to narrow down the victim's identity without help from a seasoned pro. During the investigation, a man who'd been adopted as a child named Glenn Stevenson matched with the victim as a half-sibling. Detectives tracked down a living sister in Michigan who shares a father with Stevenson named Kimberly Beach. The woman told them that she had a sister named Nicole Weiss, who fell out of touch with the family during the late 1990s after moving to the West Coast. Beach then gave a DNA sample, and the results proved that she and the murder victim were sisters. Nicole Weiss was 21 years old and lived about two hours away from San Diego in Los Angeles at the time of her murder, leading to speculation that her body may have been transported from there after she was killed. Authorities declined to elaborate on why she lost contact with her family, but Beach had good memories of her missing sister. She told CBS 8 that she suspected Nicole might have died, but that she never imagined that it would be so brutal. While one big part of the mystery has been solved, the other obvious question remains. Who killed Nicole? After finally identifying her remains, cold case detectives appeal to the public for tips. They're hoping someone knows something and comes forward with information that could help crack the case. Number 1. Jerry Lynn Burns the small community of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, was both terrified and outraged by the murder of 18-year-old Michelle Martinko, who was found stabbed to death in her parents' car outside a shopping mall during the early morning hours on December 20, 1979. She'd been stabbed at least eight times, and her hands were covered in defensive wounds, showing that the young woman had fought for her life. Police quickly ruled out robbery as a motive and theorized, based on the gruesome nature of the crime, that the homicide was personal. The killer didn't leave any fingerprints behind. He cut his hand during the murder and left blood at the scene, but in the absence of DNA technology, this was a relatively meaningless clue. In other words, authorities had no physical evidence to help them identify suspects. Left with no other choice, they relied on the public to phone in tips while interviewing hundreds of people in an effort to narrow in on who the killer might be. But within a year of Michelle's murder, the suspect list had grown to include over 80 names. When DNA technology came along, detectives obtained the killer's profile from old evidence and began comparing it against the long list of possible suspects. At least 60 people were tested and cleared, and as the technology improved even more in recent years, law enforcement had the DNA sample reanalyzed and were able to narrow their pool of suspects to a very small number of people. Included in that group was 65-year-old Jerry Lynn Burns of Manchester, Iowa, whose DNA was obtained covertly in 2018 by an investigator who saw him throw out a straw at a restaurant. And lo and behold, it was a match. Burns claimed that he had no idea why his DNA might have been at the crime scene. 
He was a well-known and respected businessman in his community of 5,000 individuals, and people were completely shocked by news of his arrest. Michelle Martinko's parents likely would have reacted differently, but they both passed away long before Burns was brought to justice. He pleaded not guilty to the 39-year-old slaying and maintained his innocence all throughout his trial. But after deliberating for just three hours, the jury found him guilty. Burns was sentenced to life without parole and remains behind bars after unsuccessfully appealing his conviction. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of your worst ever experience at a drive-thru? Tell us about it in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.